Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at One Eye Open, One Eye Closed, number one and number two. This was a comic book anthology from 1994, and it was published by Chiasmus. And I'm pretty sure Chiasmus was formed just to put these out. As far as I know, they didn't put out anything else. They, maybe they put out some mini comics, it looks like. But um, the, this comic is definitely comes from the mini comic world. A lot of the contributors are uh, part of that world. And But it, it's kind of a, a nice thing in 1984. These guys are trying to make an adult comic book anthology. It's uh, not that great, but there's some interesting stuff in it. And it's definitely better than getting, a, you know, a new issue of uh, Young Blood at the time or Profit. So we start off with this really nice uh, cover. I love this painting. It's by this guy, Milt Klingensmith. Never heard of him uh, before or since. A really nice logo. This pretty cool looking, pretty sharp cover. We have a nice little uh, contents page. This is designed by Chad Woody. He kind of is the co-designer of this uh, comic book. The editor is Robert Lewis. I'm not familiar with him either. So we start off with Tommy Hawkins' Bad Day at My House. Story by Ed Le Lemieux. Never heard of him before or since. Pictures by Dave Cooper. So this is a young Dave Cooper. Uh, I, right around this time, his first Fantagraphics comic was coming out, Press Tongue. That didn't really set the world on fire either. Um, it was years later when Dave Cooper really uh, got his amazing style down. But his early style is pretty damn good. I think everyone recognized that Dave Cooper was this really tight, great cartoonist. Like, look at the lettering. He just really was in command of his uh, abilities. But his stories were never that good. Um, he was trying to make these little short stories, trying to get in anthologies. Uh, he even talks about in some of the stories how he wants to be an indie cartoonist, like a big shot. You know, get signed by Fantagraphics. He did. Uh, Press Tongue didn't do that great because the stories were still not that good. But a few years later, Dave Cooper, I don't know what happened. He just, I guess, matured. And he just got really good at writing stories as well as his art getting way better. But look at this. This is pretty nice cartooning. Pretty damn good. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is about this kid... I guess his father died one day in the kitchen. He exploded inexplicably. He just blew up. And uh, brains, blood, and guts were everywhere. That's pretty gross. His mother walks into the room and she doesn't even seem that, uh, you know, grieved. She's just annoyed that there's a mess. And she says, listen, you better have this cleaned up in two hours. I'm leaving. And the kid's like, but it's dad's mess. So this poor kid is in charge of cleaning up his dad's viscera. But then he realizes, he says, hey, every part is here. He, it's salvageable. He gets a needle and thread and he starts sewing up his dad with all the body parts. Reconstructive surgery, D DIY style. He, uh, joins the two halves of the brain with shoelaces. He uses glue. It's almost like a Hobby Lobby project. And when he's done sewing up his dad, he pours the remaining blood and stuff down his throat. And the father didn't move. It didn't work. But then the kid remembers that every morning his dad would drink coffee. That's what he needed to get going. So he pours some down his dad's gullet and it wakes him up. But it's kind of like he's just a mindless zombie. He just goes, Err. You're welcome, Dad. So look at this. Cooper's really good. But of course, then he got 18 times better. This next story is called Do You Like Yourself? And it's by Matt Klingensmith, the cover artist. Really interesting uh, style going on here. I mean... He probably read some Mary Fleener comics, maybe got the idea from her to rip off 
uh, Picasso. I kind of like the way he does it better, though, to be honest. I love this crazy lettering. Well, not necessarily crazy. It's actually really good. Good calligraphy. Basically, this is a fake ad for this thing called the Zippo Change, where they would basically put it, install a zipper under your armpit. And then you could uh, change your appearance. You'd have a whole wardrobe of bodies to choose from anytime you wanted. You could crawl out of your uh, body and take on a new one. Not really that funny, but nice cartoon. I kind of dig this. I'd like to see more of this guy. Next, we have The Raven, an adaptation not of Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, but of Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Raven, which I didn't know existed. Let me move something real quick, guys. I think something's blocking the light. Okay. And this is uh, illustrated by Chad Woody. Chad Woody did a lot of lettering around this time for, uh, like, I think, a caliber and other independent comics. Look at this great logo. He's a pretty good illustrator. Look at this. It's pretty nice. So basically, this is the story about a crow who sees this acorn lying around. And he figures he's going to stuff it in the ground, plant it. Then he flies off. I don't know if crows migrate, but uh, he does. He just leaves that area. Many years pass. Really nice illustration. This guy's pretty good. And he comes back to that area with a, a mate, a female crow. And the acorn has grown into a pretty big oak tree. They built a nest in the topmost bough and raised some chicks. And they were very happy. One day a woodsman comes by, chops down the tree. The wood from that tree is turned into this ship. I forgot to mention that all of the, the chicks were killed when he felled the tree. And the mother died of a broken heart. So this uh, crow... He wants revenge. And luckily, on the, the ship is uh, sailing around the ocean and a huge storm comes up. And the whole ship sinks. All the, all the souls on board, the perishing souls, they all died. And then the crow sees death in this cloud Looks like a Barco lounger. And he basically thanks him profusely for killing everyone on the ship. Revenge, it was sweet. This next one's called The Silent Theater, The Professor. This is by Robert Lewis, the editor. And, uh, I mean, look at this art style. This is so 1994. <laughs> this is so, you could totally peg it. But um, it's not bad. It's kind of an interesting little style he developed. I'm sure he's very happy with it. But um, yeah, the writing is just not very good. This is probably why you've never heard of Robert Lewis. I think if he was a decent writer, I'm sure the style would have been enough to, you know, make the stories decent. Little homage to Dr. Seuss here, this Seussian like machine. Something about like he's trying to undo a Rubik's Cube. He needs this machine to do it. It's really dumb. But I don't know. It's kind of interesting cartooning. Kind of reminds me of Phil Hester. Phil Hester drew even weirder than he does. So this next one's odd. It's called Chutney Point Part One. Story by Tony Bahado and uh, Matthew Calais. Matthew Calais does all the art as well. And we see this huge cast of characters. Apparently this was going to be a sprawling uh, ensemble story. But unfortunately, this is all we get. Issue number two doesn't have part two of this. 
So we start off at uh, this uh, grocery store owned by Roman Countrymen. And one day he's doing his job and he goes outside and he sees a dead body. He calls up the sheriff. Apparently Roman's a kind of a kook because the sheriff's all like, uh, yeah, whatever. And he sends a deputy just because, you know, he's got to due diligence. But he's pretty sure that uh, Roman's lying or just having an episode or something. Meanwhile, we see the dead body and we see this stranger lift it up and carry it to this field. So, of course, when the deputy shows up, Roman is all like, I swear I was right here. And uh, the deputy is just, uh, you know, basically doing doing his job, pretending to believe him. This cartoon is very goofy to me. I don't know. I kind of like it, though, for this kind of goofy story. I mean, obviously very crude. This guy doesn't really have much chops, but it uh, kind of looks funny to me. So now we cut away. We see this woman. She finds the dead body in the field. So Roman is at the diner where his uh, girlfriend, N Nanette, works. She doesn't believe him either. She's like, just because I love you, it doesn't mean I have to believe everything you say. And the sheriff comes in and says, hey, we found a body in the wheat field. He's like, see, I told you. So they want him to come down to identify the body. Next, we see this uh, doctor. Let's see what his name is. I forgot his name. Dr. Imbrium. And his butler brings the phone in. Turns out it's Agent 3. This guy works for him. This is the guy who moved that body. He tells the doctor what happened. But as far as they know, the body hasn't been found yet. So they think they're all safe and sound. So this doctor, you can already tell he's evil by the way he's drawn. Um, he's working on some nefarious plan. And we'll never find out what happened. <laughs> Next, we have Increasing the Gerbils, uh, written and drawn by Jeff Nicholson. And really nice letters by Chad Woody, I gotta say. These are part of uh, the Through the Habit Trail stories that uh, Jeff Nicholson did, did throughout the 90s. These were amazing stories. I would never like Jeff Nicholson. I never got into Ultra Klutz. His style really kind of bugs me. Even though he can draw pretty well certain things, because I think he's a graphic designer. He was to pay the rent. But just that, uh, the way he draws people's faces, never really liked it. But that's how good Through the Habit Trails was, the, the stories. I really liked them. They're <clears throat> basically, they're kind of uh, obviously autobiographical. They're about Jeff Nicholson, um, you know, working as a graphic designer at this firm where all these other artists work, you know, doing soulless work instead of doing what they really want to do. Because, you know, you got to pay the rent. And at this place, there's a series of habit trails running through the, the offices. The gerbils were living symbiosis between our employers and ourselves. They were released regularly for the benefit of the staff because they became empaths of stress and despair. So it's almost like they would leech the stress and despair, um, basically placate the workers a little. They were sucker for them. And uh, they only had a three week lifespan due to just sucking, soaking up all this misery. So we see our narrator, just his life is pretty, uh, pretty shitty. <laughs> works at this place that he hates all day. He tries to do his own creative work at night, but he's drained. In fact, uh, I didn't point this out earlier, but all the workers have little taps on them. So the bosses can come by and just drain them of their creativity. Obviously, uh, a lot of 
people can't stand this kind of strain. And one of his coworkers starts sleeping there at night, not even going home. And one morning when the narrator comes in, he sees his coworker somehow, he somehow compressed himself into one of the gerbil cages. He was ret retained by the company as a surrogate gerbil and lived far beyond the expected three weeks. Oh, that's some good stuff. We have some ads, mostly for mini comics. There's an ad for Press Tongue for, by Dave Cooper. And then we have a nice, really nice back cover by that Milt Klingensmith guy. That's really sharp. Okay, now we have number two, which would be the last issue. We have a, a cover by Matt Madden, who at the time was a pretty much a very popular mini comic guy. He had some uh, mini comic, what was it called? Terrifying Steamboat Stories. He was getting written up in the comics shirt a lot at the time. So he's their uh, cover artist. We got the contents page. And we start off with another Through the Habit Trail story by Jeff Nicholson, Jarhead. And this is obviously about his alcoholism, but it's kind of like got this veneer of surreal business going on. So basically he realizes that uh, just to function, he has to basically stay drunk all the time. So he actually has this jar full of beer. I guess he would sustain himself just by the carbonation. And so usually he would like go home and by the time he went to bed, there'd be a little beer left and it would um, evaporate before he woke up. But he realized he, fi he finds a better way. He realizes if he fills his jar as soon as he gets home, he can, you know, have a few hours to do his creative work. And, uh, of course, as the night progressed, he has to do tasks of decreasing complexity because he's getting, losing his dexterity and coordination. So basically at the end of the night, he just has his uh, recreation time and just has fun and he eats his dinner. So it seems to work okay for a little while. Um, as long as he keeps the jar full, when he goes to work the next day, he feels okay. He's in this this dead fog of formaldehyde, he says. So the day just blurs by. Every now and then it drained the jar, put in fresh beer. I like this, he says, it seems my right brain had swollen to 10 times the size of my diminished left brain. So his, uh, Dionysian side of his brain is uh, crushing out the Apollonian side. It's just like, maybe we shouldn't get drunk tonight. And the, the other half of the brain's like, fuck you, let's party. So basically he's staying up all night now. And he kind of likes it though, because he does have the energy to work on his own work at night. It seems like this process is when the bosses try to tap him, nothing comes out. Which makes him happy. Because he doesn't uh, like them draining him. But then bad things start happening to his body. He starts having problems with his wrists. His hands start shaking. He kind of gives up exercise, which kind of, that kept him, uh, his system vital. But uh, he's just drunk all the time. He basically has the, you know, starts seeing bugs on his body. He's got the DTs, it sounds like. He starts using uh, dark beer. Like uh, darker ales and malts. And then the world becomes this, <laughs> you know, you can barely see the world through the dark sepia li uh, liquid. One night, the light casts through the glass and black beer. It's in just such a way that an image appeared on the inside directly in front of my face. It was my reflection. It scared the hell out of me. And we see him lying on the floor with a baseball bat. 
it scared him so much he uh, cracked open the jar. So I guess that was his moment of clarity. Next we have a pretty fun little strip, uh, Paradise Mislaid. This is by Ted Bowman, a mini comic stalwart for years. We saw a, uh, one of his strips in that uh, giant size mini comics that Eclipse put out uh, a couple months back. We made a video for that one. And we see Satan. He's trying to uh, get served at Heaven's Diner. I guess there's no diners in hell. And the arching, Archangel Gabriel is the, the fry cook. And he kind of puts up with Satan. It seems like he kind of begrudgingly kind of likes him. But Satan's always causing trouble. Shooting sausages out of his nose. Leaving a penny tip. So finally, uh, Gabriel kicks him out of the diner. Jesus try to, tries to get a free uh, birthday meal, even though it's May 9th. And he's like, who are you kidding? You're Jesus. We all know your birthday. So uh, the next day, Satan brings all these kittens, <laughs> these cute little kittens to God's diner. I guess it's a fish special. <laughs> I like the way he draws these cats. And Gabriel says, sorry, the boss says I can't serve you anymore. I'll give you some of these goldfish crackers, though. So Satan says, screw you. We'll just have to suck on Leviathan again for dinner. <laughs> Such a weird idea. I guess they just, you know, the, the great beast Leviathan, they just lick his hide for essential salts when they're hungry. So Satan says, ah, there must be better than this twisted serpent, you know, licking the serpent. Let's try and find something else. I guess in hell there's only one little food cart, red hot Italian sausages, and uh, they're very overpriced. This Bowman art's really nice. It's pointless, pointless shading. So Satan finally has, has had enough. He gets on his uh, telephone and he calls God to demand that fallen angels are allowed to eat in his diner. God won't even pick up the phone. So he basically tries to have a, like in Selma, Alabama, he says, we're going to have a lie-in at God's restaurant. And he gets a bunch of his demons and he straps them to his sleigh like he's a demonic Santa Claus. And as he flies away, he says, we'll build a hell diner in heaven's despite. Next we have, uh, you, one might call him the king of the mini comics, Brad W. Foster. That guy uh, did so many mini comics. He was like a pioneer of that stuff. This is called Physics for the Confused. And just some little science gag, kind of goofy. Here we got a beautifully drawn Dave Cooper piece, and I'm pretty sure he wrote this too. Look at this style. You can see a lot of Jim Woodering in it. So this is like Dave Cooper's like heading towards the style we know and love by him. This guy's cooking up this repulsive meal. And then we zoom in on the food. We see this little house and this guy is making a sculpture. It's pretty, just like, a, it's almost like a dream comic. It's very, uh, very odd. But man, every panel is just gorgeous in this. This is definitely uh, worth owning this comic for, because I don't know if Dave Cooper's ever going to reprint this stuff. I don't think it ever was reprinted. And I'm pretty sure he's probably embarrassed by this early stuff. Now that he's a fine artist and all. But I'll just let you look at the story yourself. It's uh, all wordless. Love the architecture of that building. 
So odd. <laughs> so I have no idea really what happens at the end here, but I don't care. Some nice stuff. Next story is Nice Smelling Flowers by Blair Wilson. Another person I never heard of before since. Kind of an interesting cartoony style. Kind of like it, I think. <laughs> it's, it's, I probably would like it if the story was any good, but it's pretty much uh, just nonsense. This woman's talking about how much she loves flowers. Yeah, these are nice looking pages, I think. Definitely unique cartoon style. Yeah, it's almost just like this goofy poem about flowers and this woman's dancing about. Hey, I think this was made for a magazine. That's why he has these filler panels at the bottom. Some of this stuff looks pretty interesting. It's like Roy Tompkins and just really goofy, zany, cartoony. So now we have The Sorrow Tree by R. Robert Lewis, the editor, once again. It's based on a short story by S.B. Cobbs. And this is kind of like a poem, an illustrated poem. Kind of nice art. Nice uh, panels, but it's just, uh, I don't know. It's a poem. I don't quite get what he's talking about. It's personal. Not bad. You have a one-pager by Pam Bliss called Bat Facts. <laughs> kind of like how silly this is. Uh, giving you directions on how to fax a bat. Bat, smash flat, fax, fax, cut out, extract, flap, flap, relax. That's that. Retirement played a story by Matt Madden. We see this old guy. It looks like some kind of, I don't know, Orwellian future. This is some crude art. <laughs> I don't know what to think of it, to be honest. I guess it kind of fits the story perfectly. But it's just not that fun to look at. Basically, he gets uh, this form from the government. He says, you have to report to the senior registrar. And he goes down to Mall Town. Apparently, all, like, government functions are there. So then we, uh, basically, it turns into a Kafka-esque, like, uh, maze of bureaucracy. bureaucracy. Waiting on lines all day. Every time he tries to ask for help, people just yell at him. It's just a very cold, harsh world. Of course, when he finally gets to the window, like in all these stories, the woman says, oh no, you need this form, which is uh, across town. You have to get it at this other building. So he gets on the bus, goes downtown. Central Services. I think that was the name of the, the corporation in Brazil. Probably wrong. And he gets the form. After more rigmarole and malarkey. And then he goes back to Malltown to turn in this paperwork that he got. So basically his paperwork is all, um, they're informing him that uh, he should be dead by now. <laughs> it's like, we need to update your information. You're, you're, you shouldn't be alive. So you're basically, he's basically uh, processing these papers so he can die. And so he's walking all around Mall Town. It's closing. And he can't find the office he needs to. He's getting in a tizzy. And he has a heart attack. And dies. Right as 5 o'clock. 
tolls and the place closes down. So I guess he didn't need the paperwork after all. Kind of interesting. But yeah, this art, I don't really want to look at it, but it does fit the story. And here we see more ads for mini comics from the contributors and other kind of comics. And a little editorial from Robert Lewis. And we have another, a back cover by Matt Madden. Instructions for the use of this comic. Kind of cute. So that's it, guys. One eye open and one eye closed. I'm sorry, just one eye open, one eye closed. Number one and number two. Hope you enjoyed looking at these today with me. Um, yeah, they're not... Uh, there's definitely better comics out there. But I just got this thing for anthologies. As long as they're readable, <laughs> I can't get rid of them. Every now and then I like to take them off the shelf and flip through them. And, I mean, there's some awesome stuff in, in these. But just a lot of stuff that's just kind of like, eh, not bad. Not that great either. But, uh, yeah, I'm keeping them in the Academy, at least... Uh, for the time being. So uh, that's it for today's video, and I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.